Hey, thank you for joining us today at Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Clarkson. Special guest today, Dr. Thomas Ice. Uh, Tommy, as I may call you. Yes. Uh, researcher, author, been a pastor, been in ministry for a number of decades, and uh, really is the executive director and co-founder of the Pre-Tribulation Research Center in the Dallas, Texas metro area. Uh, a defender of our pre-tribulation rapture position. Right. Yeah. Because that's really come under fire in recent days yeah. or years. Well, it does because we've seen a shift from uh, among younger Christians away from the Bible to social issues. Yes. And, of course, the rapture isn't uh, a big social issue because it's when God's going to remove the church. They see it as escapism, I guess. Right. They want to be involved here and now and change the world. You can do both as a Christian. You can, but I don't think we're going to have institutional changes until the Lord returns. We're not going to be post-millennialists and usher in the kingdom. No, we're not. That's not going to happen. But God uses us for restraining evil. That's the purpose of government, civil government, you know, as... He talked about after the flood when he established civil government. And uh, so the point is, is that this is a time in which we're calling out people who are going to reign and rule with Christ in a a redeemed environment as well. And it requires not just the curse being removed, but resurrected people to bring in the kind of millennium that's described in the Bible. Right. If, If you go for anything else, then you have to dumb it down. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, if you take the Bible literally, well, even if you don't take the Bible literally, God is going to bring in a, uh, a righteous kingdom where righteousness reigns and rules. That's right. We don't have the option to dumb it down, as you No, say. we don't. And, you know, one of those social issues that you alluded to that many young people are passionate about today is the Palestinian-Israel crisis. Yes. And even the, uh, the young millennial evangelicals, They don't take the historic uh, evangelical positions toward Israel or prophecy at all. And they see uh, Israel as the oppressor and the Palestinians as the oppressed. And they've really bought that whole line of propaganda. And that's what we speak to today. Your newest book, The Case for Zionism. Why Christians should support Israel. Yeah, I, I went last year to something called Christ at the Checkpoint. It was their fourth uh, conference they have have it every other year and uh, there were probably a hundred college students there uh-huh. from, uh, mainly from the United States uh, some from Great Britain and Australia and South Africa and stuff and uh, they were there basically blaming dispensationalism our belief system uh-huh. for the quote unquote occupation the word occupation yeah and there is no occupation no. by Israel. There uh, is actually no nation or people of called Palestinians. Well, that's right. And uh, they didn't deal with the issues that are the real issue, and that is uh, Arab terrorism. Uh-huh. That was kind of the w- elephant in the room. In fact, they concluded the, the president of the school, or he's not the president, but he was the guy that headed up this con- conference. And by the way, you know, he had a uh, Ph.D. from Westminster Seminary, you know, Uh and another guy had a Ph.D. from Trinity. These are evangelical schools. Right. uh, Well, one of our foremost scholars today uh, for for conservative evangelicals, uh, Dr. N.T. Wright from from, uh, Britain, he he is a replacement theologian. Yeah, and I don't think, just because he wrote a book defending the resurrection, I think most of his other books have not been conservative. Right. And especially the stuff on Israel, you know, and, right. you know, he makes fun of, uh, of uh, our views and says it's American craziness. Right. And stuff. When, of course, actually, the modern version of it began in England. It but, did. But that's a whole England, Ireland. That's a whole nother discussion. But getting back, the uh, point is, is this guy concluded at the end of the conference that our greatest challenge or enemy was dispensationalism and so that means that the people many of the people watching this program are their enemies and why because they say that most of the world supports the Palestinians but Americans do not support the Palestinians uh, because why because of our history and background we're we've always been Uh pro-Israel because of our Puritan founding etc 
and more recently our dispensationalism, like our planet Earth left behind, all of these things, uh -huh. and they uh, make s snide remarks about it. By the way, Hank Hennegraaf came and spoke. You know, oh he's, he's an anti-Israel guy. He's a total preterist. Yes, not a total, but he's a partial preterist. Yeah. But he is in a, a lot of historically fulfilled prophecy. Yes, though, it's already. exactly. And so, uh, therefore, because this ha has had an ascendancy in evangelicalism, and it has in the past, it was a, a given that you were pro-Israel uh -huh. as an evangelical in the past because of your belief in the Bible. Not just prophecy, but the Abrahamic covenant. Yes. Genesis, I, I, God will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, even if we didn't have prophecy. That's enough for Christians who support Israel. But nevertheless, and so he said, as a result, we then uh, have a political impact when we vote, and therefore that makes America different, and America is the enabler of Israel, and therefore... Uh, you know, it's because of dispensationalism, basically. Right. Well, I know I, I wrote an article for our magazine just as the year ended, as we came up to Christmas. You're aware of the famous uh, UN resolution, Security Council resolution, against and condemning Israel. And that's been brought forward so many times. The U.S. would always veto it. But Obama instructed his minions to just abstain. And so we did, and it went forward. And they said the room erupted into applause. Oh, yes. And, of course, Netanyahu quickly condemned the whole thing. And Trump tweeted, wait until January 20th, things right. will be different. And they but are different. Now. We're, we're, yeah, we, they are. They are officially, but yeah. we're still almost at a tipping point. And you said, you know, the world is sympathetic to Palestine. You're right, but really beneath that, it's that they're against Israel. Yes. You could substitute whoever in there, whoever would be this victim. They're really against Israel, and that's anti-Semitism, of course. Exactly, and, and that's what uh, we call the new anti-Semitism, and I talk about that in our what book. What do you mean by the new? Or it's kind of a, 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 well, go ahead. Right, the new anti-Semitism is that before Israel became a nation, people hated the Jews as individuals. And, uh, you, you know, you see that in World War II uh -huh. and Nazis and all of this. Even the church often. Yes, the church uh, throughout the Middle Ages uh, killed millions of Jews uh -huh. through, through the church, uh, you know, Catholic church and, and Protestants as well, unfortunately. Although Protestant, the Protestant Reformation began to bring a change. Right. You know, and so, but it's a mixed bag. Uh -huh. And uh, as a result, uh, when Israel became a nation, people would use the same types of arguments against the nation of Israel that they would use against individual Jews. And so hating Israel as a nation is called the new anti-Semitism. And so they say, well, heck, can't we criticize a nation for their policies? Well, yes, but uh, all criticism of Israel is not necessarily anti-Semitic, but uh, all criticism, uh, but all, uh, but they are involved in criticizing Israel often out of an anti-Semitic uh, motive there. Right. And so that's called the new anti-Semitism. It's, it's a form of anti-Zionism. That's, that that's a term Israel that doesn't have a right the to the land. And we know, we said last time, that God gave this land to Israel. Yes. And, and that was to the patriarchs. Yes. That was unconditional regardless of what their descendants did, that was made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's right. And my organization about five years ago had a guy um, uh, named Jacques Gautier from Canada who's an international lawyer, and he wrote a PhD dissertation at the University of Geneva in Switzerland uh, in the area of international law demonstrating that Israel has all the legal rights to the land. That's what I wanted to ask you, because you have a couple of chapters about Israel's right and then Israel's legal right. Yes. Follow that, distinguish that for And, of us. course, we, we believe that the right that makes it true is the Bible. You know, Absolutely. If they had no, but it just so happens that they have all the legal rights. And this goes back to the League of Nations and the World Balfour War Declaration I. And the Balfour Declaration was simply a statement, and this is the 100th anniversary of it, uh, of British foreign policy. But the 
uh, Lord um, Lloyd George, who was yeah. the Prime Minister of England at the time, and Balfour was basically his Foreign Minister or Secretary of State, and he had been Prime Minister for 10 years as well before that. And so th those were two guys, and they had during World War I a war cabinet. And so in parliamentary governments, where you can't call Parliament up and have a big debate like you see on C-SPAN or something, uh, right. them having today, uh, they would get a government made up of nine to 12 representatives, and they call that a war cabinet. And you couldn't have, if, you couldn't have picked a better war cabinet that was pro-Israel than the one they happened to have, including Lloyd Nelson, who just happens, uh -huh. he was from Wales, and he was adopted and uh, into the, uh, and he was the son of a Baptist minister from Wales. And he was very pro-Israel. Uh, Balfour was Scottish, and he grew up learning uh, the Bible and all of this. And you have all of these guys on there, except for a couple of them, were so pro-Israel because of their biblical upbringing and uh, background. biblical worldview. Yeah, which I talk about in the book. Uh -huh. And uh, so they issue the Balfour Declaration, and, he, and Lloyd George secretly sends his best is, uh, general, General Allenby, from the Western Front in Europe to the Palestine campaign, as it was called, because Britain was losing, and he secretly transferred 50,000 troops uh, to make sure that they took Jerusalem, and they did. And they did that in 1919. Balfour Declaration was issued in 1917, and the, they captured Jerusalem in 1919. And uh, Lloyd George became, was prime minister until 1922. And so the, after the war was over, you had the Paris uh, Peace Agreement where they divided the lands uh, of the former Ottoman Empire, which was the Muslim Empire. And they created what they call mandates. And uh, for example, Syria and uh, Lebanon was given to France, and they were to oversee those two countries becoming countries like a father oversees a son. Uh. And so 10 years later, you know, uh, they became countries on their own, but they needed guidance after the war to become countries because they were part of the broader Ottoman Empire. And Britain had Mesopotamia, which 10 years later became Iraq, and right. they had... Uh, so-called Palestine, which included both Jordan, and right. I call it Transjordan, and Israel, everything, all of that land. And uh, they, they had some other mandates as well. And so they weren't able to settle all of this in relation to the Middle East at the Paris Peace Conference. So they had another conference called the conference that met at San Remo in 1920, April of 1920. And there you had the 72 nations of the League of Nations, the United States was not part of it because we, even though it was thought up by our president, Wilson, uh -huh. uh, that we didn't participate because uh, we didn't want to be part of that global thing. And as a result, uh, 72 nations voted to give a mandate to Britain to make Palestine a Jewish state. And so they incorporated the Balfour Declaration into a legal document that initially was agreed to by the Arabs, Faisal. At, at the Paris Accord. At, the, at San Remo. San, I'm sorry, okay. Yes, at San Remo. And then he got assassinated, uh, you know, and Turkoman took over in um, Turkey and all of this, and they undermined it. But what really undermined the implementation of, of this, called the Mandate, which was started in 1922, was... Uh, Yasser Arafat's uncle, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who, who invented terrorism. And you had uh, him using massacres of Jews to do that. Starting in 1920, you had the famous massacre at Hebron where they ran the Jews out for the first time in 3,000 years, killed over 100. A lot of people don't realize there was a civil war Yes. From 1935 to about 1938, over 107,000 people were killed uh, during that time, mainly Arabs, but British, a couple thousand British, Jews, 7,000 Jews. 
uh, 9,000 maybe, I can't remember. And uh, so we explain all of that, and that's what kept Israel from becoming a nation earlier. And so the legal right of Israel to the land was granted through treaty. You don't make tre uh, international law based on UN resolutions. Right. You have to come in and agree to this. And this is why Israel's not occupying the land, because in for after the war in 1948, uh, you, they simply have a ceasefire agreement. And the, even that ceasefire agreement with the UN uh, says that Israel is not the occupier. Right. It says that. But you get all these people on TV, these leftists and the Arabs, like, occupy, occupy, Israel's occupying the land of it. No, they're not. And uh, they won't negotiate with them. And they said they're supposed to negotiate, you know, a settlement on, on this kind of stuff. And so... This is the point, is Israel, based on international law, is demonstrated by this Jacques Gautier and his PhD dissertation at Geneva, uh, University of Geneva, demonstrates, and others have written whole thick books on this, and even Net the Netanyahu government uh, about five or six years ago uh, had former Supreme Court people in Israel do a study, and they agreed unanimously it's called the Cohen Report or something like that, right. or the Levy, Levy Report, Levy Report, that Israel has the legal right to the entire uh, land of Israel today. And so it's a matter of them exerting their political will to do that. And I don't know how that's going to come out, but the point is we point out that Israel has a legal right, but they're still, uh, everybody's going against them. They know, are. As if they don't have the right to the land. It looks for the time being immediately foreseeable the United States will be standing, you know, with, for Israel, yes. with Israel, and that's very good to know. But uh, we're talking to Dr. Thomas Ice, uh, his newest book, The Case for Zionism, and why Christians should defend and support Israel and Israel's right to the land and to exist. So, um, you know, we are offering this, and you can, as always, go to our website, prophecyinthenews.com, or call the 800 number on your screen. And this book is just out, and it's available for 1495 and shipping and handling. Uh, you will enjoy it. It'll, it'll inform you. And uh, Dr. Ice, we just have maybe uh, uh, time enough to talk about some of the theology through the ages of the church how the church kind of deviated from Zionism and has somewhat returned, but is still conflicted about that. Maybe you could give us some of those fascinating uh, instances you've referred me to. Yeah, well, the, the Reformation laid the groundwork, even though the, we, I've yet to find any reformers who actually were pro-Israel. But the idea that the Bible should be interpreted literally uh, that was a plank. Began to be restored. Now, they, it took them a long time to apply that properly. Right. But at least they got back to that. And the Middle Ages had very few, if anybody, uh, who believed that Israel had a future. Now, some believed that the Jews would be saved at the end of history. But that's different than the land of Israel, you know, them returning to their land. And so you have a guy named Francis Kett, uh, who was from Norwich, England, and he had two degrees from Cambridge. And he'd written a book about Christianity. And, and, and he mentioned a couple of free pages about the restoration of the Jews to the land. And what year uh, roughly is this? Uh, 1580s. Okay. And uh, he was burned at the stake because of that. You know, and uh, it's amazing. It shows you, uh, you know, even if, there probably were other people out there with the similar views, but, you know, it's kind of a tough environment. And then in 1627, you have, uh, did I talk about him on the last program? Or Mr. Finch? Finch, yes. We did somewhat. Yes. I think we didn't explore very deeply, though, the, the really the Puritan influence as it came into America. Right. That would be important to, to trace. Well, the Puritans... Uh, became almost totally premillennial in the 1600s. People like Crom Oliver Cromwell, uh, the founders of America, the Mathers. Richard uh -huh. Mather, who immigrated, he, he made a statement that virtually all the Puritans were premillennial. Wow. And 
Increase Mather, who was the second president of Harvard, and uh, he married John Cotton, who was the most famous Puritan minister in Boston, and named right. his son Cotton Mather, you see, because uh, he was married to John Cotton's daughter. And Cotton Mather, you know, uh, they debate whether he or Jonathan Edwards was the most brilliant person in American history. Right. Cotton Mather wrote 425 books that were published, but he finished second to Jonathan Edwards in 1976 to a, a poll uh -huh. of who's the most brilliant person in the history of America. I'm happy to call it a draw. Yeah, but <laughs> they were big time premillennialists and they wrote a lot of books on prophecy and especially Increase Mather believed the Jews were going to be restored. He wrote a book, his first book on this. It was revised seven or eight times, expanded, and... Uh, Cotton Mather had talked about how he had hoped to lead a Jewish person to Christ, all of this kind of stuff. So this is the foundation we have in America. It's pretty amazing. It's different from uh, Europe that Very had much. all of that medieval anti-Semitism, that had anti-Semitism among many of the Protestants. We have a different background, and that's why we ended up with six, seven million Jews in the United States. And because it's also why God shed his grace on thee. Exactly. Because it was the Abrahamic covenant again. I will bless those who bless you. The preaching of the gospel. Even today, Kevin, 80% of the money to support world missions comes from the United States. Right. And this could be why he could be giving us a reprieve here. Yes. Uh, with uh, a more Christian-friendly president and administration. Uh -huh. And so, and definitely... Uh, more friendly toward Israel, although I don't like what he said about the settlements recently. Right, right. You know, but that's a whole nother... That was a 3 a.m. tweet, perhaps. We'll yeah, to, one of those... To uh, take it with a grain of salt. Right. So we, we have a very different thing. And, and what's concerning us is the shift away by young people. Uh, you have people like Lynn Hybels, Bill Hybels' wife out yes. there, supporting... Palestinian you have magazines and others that are supporting them uh, because they're into the social issues. You see. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, and I think Lynn is a graduate of Wheaton. I know Bill is. Yes. I, so, I, you know, somewhere... Prob she probably is. Somewhere yeah. something sort of straight off path. Well, Wheaton, Wheaton took premillennialism out of their doctoral statement years ago. But okay. that's a whole other... That's another story for story, another day. Story, yes. I, I doubt if there's hardly anybody left at Wheaton that is pr even premillennial, let alone pro-Israel. Yeah. You know, uh, but you have this shift going on, especially at the academic level and uh, among younger people. Now, there's still probably, there's still a majority of younger people that are pro-Israel, but this is the first time in our lifetimes we've seen a shift. Right. And so... P older people, middle-aged people are still very pro-Israel and even a majority of younger people. But, you know, it, it's very different. One of my sons, my youngest son, after he got out of seminary, uh, did a year and a half internship at the Evangel Bible Church of Berkeley, California. And you wouldn't believe some of the stuff he saw on the campus. We all saw the rioting that was going on the other night and everything. But he, was, he actually was on the campus one day and so he saw an Arab hit a Jewish girl. Huh. The Jews had set up and were having some event in the mall area at Berkeley. And this guy hit this Jewish girl. He pulls out his camera and he filmed stuff from that point on. And they came and took over a Jewish rally, yeah. free Palestine. When I was there last April, uh, they had spray painted on the sidewalk, free Palestine and all this kind of stuff. So this is what's taken over on college campuses. There, there have been over a dozen riots over Israel, uh -huh. you know, on, on the college campus. And unfortunately, it's now impacting Christians. And the news is silent about a lot of this. Too. Yes. You don't, you don't hear it. Can you give me a, maybe a minute and a half answer to this question? There is uh, today, you know, even a position by some that the modern Jewish people are not truly the ethnic descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah, that... That is something involving the na the Khazar, as they call them, and that was a real country that existed uh, by the Black Sea, you know, in either Ukraine or Russia today. And uh, they, in the seven, 
late 700s, they were confronted with either becoming Islamic or Christian, and both had large empires. They would have been absorbed and lost their national identity into either the Christendom, the Byzantine Empire, or uh-huh. the Islamic Empire. And so they converted to Judaism ah. for about 150 years. As a matter of convenience. And so a lot, there's this whole view out there that the uh, Ashkenazi Jews, which are 85% of the Jews in the world today, are not really Jews. They're Gentiles who were converted to Judaism uh, from Gentile stock, and so they really don't have the blood of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob uh, flowing through their veins. And uh, I show a rebuttal. You can refute that historically uh-huh. with the events um, you know, that happened subsequently. And secondly, with the rise of DNA analysis. That's what I wondered. Has there been some DNA tests? Yes, there's been all kinds of DNA analysis and and these people do have Middle Eastern uh, DNA, you know, the, yeah. the type DNA that people that are from that area have. And so this is ridiculous. And, you know, I just wish Adolf Hitler was aware of this, that the Jews <laughs> he was putting to death weren't really Jews, but there's a lot of people like Tex Mars and people out there that are advocating these kinds of things. And so we have a chapter dealing with that. And uh, most people don't deal with those kinds of things in their books, and we try to deal with that. Well, fascinating. Our, our guest has been Dr. Thomas Ice, and he's the executive director of the Pre-Tribulation Research Center in the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area, certainly a staunch defender of biblical prophecy and the nation of Israel. His newest book, The Case for Zionism, again, go to our website or call the 800 number and get your copy. You want to be a supporter of Israel. The Bible commands us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's right. And I believe included in that prayer is the the whole idea that the Prince of Peace will return. And we should share the gospel with Jewish people. Absolutely. As well as all people, Muslims, everyone. That they may have peace with God. Yes. And and that's how we want to close our broadcast today is to share that good news with anyone who's listening that has not found peace with God. You see, the nation of Israel was created by God to bring forth the Messiah, Jesus. Jesus gave his life on the cross. He's God and he's man. He went in your place. He was innocent, so he went in your place. Being God, he is infinite. And he went in the place of all who will be saved and forgiven. And if you call on his name, he will hear you and forgive your sin. The Bible makes that promise. We urge you to do that today and let him change your life. And until he comes back, We are going to keep looking up. Thank you, my friend.